Morning, everyone. Uh, good to see a few of you online already. Morning, Tanishka. Morning, Ruby. So this is going to be the last part of Biology 3, Infection and Response. We've been through all of the different types of pathogens. We've been through immune system. We've been through the body's responses. Uh, we've looked at natural barriers. We've looked at some examples of different diseases that you need to know. Uh, we looked at what happens when it gets inside the body. And we sort of spent quite a bit of time looking at antibodies, antigens, and how they link and what their purpose is. We looked at some of the different types of white blood cells. And then we looked at monoclonal antibodies, which is probably the hardest part of this topic, what they are and how they can be used and how we can make them. So the final part today, and it probably won't take the full hour because actually it's a small uh, section of it. Now I've got some colleagues on this who are well into plants and their IDs. I go, no, no, it's a huge topic. We should carry on. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to be pulling in some resources today from a website called SAPS. Now, it's the Science and Plants for Schools website, and I've met some of the teams that work on this, uh, and they're absolutely fantastic. The resources are free. The resources are all designed for schools to use. And in fact, let me just put the website up quickly, because it's worth you making a quick note of this for use um, in your own time if you want to go through in more detail, because a lot of the resources are relevant, not just for me, but for you all as well. So if I click on that, let's just see. Wrong one. That's the window you don't need. Let's go and have a look at this one. No, nope, not that one. Oh, I can't find it for looking. This one will do. Okay. Bear with me, let me just find it for you, bring it into a different one. Because it's quite important we can actually have a look at this. This one. Okay, so you should be able to see that now, hopefully. Uh, it will come up in a few minutes when we get rid of the YouTube video. There we go, I can see it's appeared now. So this is the Science and Plants for Schools website. Uh, I want to put it up there, make a note of the web address. So it's saps.org.uk. I'm going to be using some of their PowerPoints. I'm going to be using some of their resources today just because they're really good and they've actually done a much better job than I can do. So I want to make sure they get full credit for this one. So saps.org.uk. And like I said, the team of people that work on this are really, really good. So we'll come back to that site in a minute. What we're going to have a look at to start with with this most of the issues when we start looking at plant diseases are going to go into effect photosynthesis or growth in some way. So if you're ever not sure and if you get a question in the exam that's talking about plant disease and what the effects are going to be, generally speaking, you can't go too far wrong by talking about um, discoloration and issues with photosynthesis. Cool. Morning, Capri. Uh, I can't have said a hello already. Morning, Nico. So... We've already looked at two types of disease to start with, and those disease was rose black spot, and we looked at the tobacco mosaic virus. And if you can't remember those, go back and have a look. I think it was video two, one or two, uh, probably video one in this section. And just go back and have a quick look at what I said to, about those originally. In both cases though, they're going to cause some discoloration in one form or another. That discoloration is going to cause a decrease in photosynthesis. Now, if we decrease photosynthesis, if you remember, the purpose of photosynthesis is to produce glucose. And then that glucose is going to be used for respiration. We're going to be using it for making proteins. We're going to be using it for making fats. Plants are going to use it for cellulose. And they're also going to store some of it as starch. So glucose is used in all of these different things in plants. So straight away, if we reduce the amount of glucose that's been made because we've lowered the rate of photosynthesis, the plant's not going to be able to produce these compounds. That means we're going to get much stunted growth. We're going to get things like leaf curl. We're going to get lots of issues with the plant. Morning, FF. Fantastic. It's good to see you online. Okay, so make so that's one of the things to bear in mind then when we're looking at the effects of plant disease 
it's generally going to be in one of those areas. Now, I'll talk about a few other ones as we go through, but just make a note. And if you're in the exam and you have that complete, complete brain block, go with discoloration, decrease in photosynthesis, stunted growth, um, and generally you won't be too far wrong with that. Now, we can also get decay happen. So we can start getting leaves randomly dying. Um, I've got a rose bush outside at the moment and we've got all sorts of issues with that one. Um, most of it's caused by pests and I'll come on to pests in a minute. We can get leaf curl. And if you think about the fact if the leaves aren't growing pro properly and um, they're actually sort of spread open, then, sorry, curled over rather than being spread open, then that's going to give you this effect as well. So the overall effect is still going to be a decrease in photosynthesis. Um, that would also be a form of malformation. So these are all the different effects that can be caused by different types of diseases or different types of issues in plants. Uh, we can also have pests. And this is generally can be all sorts of things. Aphids is quite a common, particularly in uh, plants like roses. <laughs> Not a problem, Ruby. Um, particularly in plants like um, aphid, sorry, like roses. And what the aphids do is they will actually start sucking the sap and those sugary fluids out, which means it's less for the plants. But by doing that, they've actually then damaged the cellulose cell wall and the issues with the plants. Sorry, Ruby, I've no idea what you said. Don't worry. I don't actually, when I save the video at the end, all of the chat messages disappear anyway. I take them all out. So nothing will be stored on there. Brilliant. So we've got those idea of pests as well. And I'm going to come back and have a look at pests and some different ways of treating um, and sort of getting rid of them or living with them or dealing with them if we can. Now, the first thing we need to do, and I think it's this one. There we go. This is one of SAP's posters that you can download um, specifically made for students. Um, this, if we do identify a problem with plants and it's a lot more widespread, maybe, um, or we've actually got the quite protect, uh, expensive plants, maybe we're a farmer or we're a greenhouse and we've got issues there, then what we would I don't notice here is that we can actually send our plants away to somebody where those diseases, those pathogens, because it's the same as in humans, can actually be identified. So in the same way that we can actually take swabs and biopsies when we're ill, we can do the same thing for plants. And they're actually plant pathologists whose job is to try and identify what is wrong with the plant and then try and come up with solutions. Now those solutions are generally easier if we're looking on a smaller scale. It gets much harder, as I'll show you in a moment, if we start looking on a sort of national or an international scale. Um, and there are some diseases at the moment that are affecting trees on that sort of level. So the first thing that they will do is they'll try and recognise some of the symptoms. So if we're looking at things like um, rose black spot, and we can go in here quickly and have a look at rose black spot. You'll notice actually it's fairly common. We've got these black spots on the leaves. It's not just on roses. So we can have it on other plants as well. We can get discoloration. So we've actually got a process here called chlorosis where there's less um, chlorophyll in the leaves. But we've also got all of these black spots as well. So it's a really easy one to identify. So actually a pathologist or a gardener who had seen this before probably wouldn't need to do any other tests. They would know what it is straight away. Uh, usually with rose black spot then it is viral so you could spray the plants with an antiviral or a um, fungicide sorry it's a fungal not a viral uh, with a fungicide uh, or more commonly what you would do is you would t pick the leaves or the branches that are affected and you would destroy them by burning um, or by other one some other means mainly so those spores cannot spread to other parts of the plants if you're really lucky that will save the plants if you're not the next option is to destroy that plant so it can't spread to other plants. So we go through and we can have a look quite quickly at that. If we can't identify it and we've looked at the particular symptoms, we've looked at the features that's wrong, the next step they would do is the same as they would do in humans. They would try and grow some of it in a lab so they can get enough of it they can actually look at under a microscope. So we would actually be taking samples 
putting them onto the agar plate in exactly the same way as I spoke about on Monday. And we would start growing it to the point that we can then try and identify. Yeah, Capri, it is plant murder at that point. The thing is, though, you've got to think, and we can't really do this with living things, but so with, um, with animals, because there's a lot more going on in terms of the nervous system. But in this case, it's a case of if we get rid of that one plant, we can save all of the others. Hi, Grace. Good to see you online. Uh, going on to the next step, then, we're looking at genomes. If we can't identify with a microscope, or maybe we're looking at things like viruses, then what we maybe want to do then is we can actually start doing DNA testing. So we can actually run it through a process called electrophoresis, and we can actually identify and match the DNA sequence to databases of known sequences. So we can try and identify it. And at that point, we can try and do something to try and actually try and cure it. The antibody tests down here, you'll notice um, if we're looking at antibody test, it's generally based on the monoclonal antibodies that we looked at last time around. Yeah, murder for the greater good in this case. And because plants generally can't answer back, uh, or make any form of communication with us, as gen we generally get away with it. Okay, so let's go back to our original window. I'm going to be moving between the two as we look at it. From a home gardener point of view, often in a lot of cases that we don't want to actually try and sort of spend the money on it. So there's a lot with most of the common issues. You can go and look it up. Like I said, go back to this particular rose plant in our garden. Um, my wife keeps trying to convince me not to get rid of this plant at the moment. Uh, but I think it's got so many different issues with it. It's about time to take this one out, uh, dig it all over, and then put a fresh rose plant in there. Because it's got rose black spot. It's got various um, pests on there. I can't remember which ones they are at the moment. Uh, I've been trying to keep an eye on them, and it's just not working. So we've had it for about two years with these issues now. Um, and it's a fairly well-established one. So I think next year what I might try and do is cut it right back to the ground, see if it grows back, and if it doesn't, just dig it up and put something else in. Uh, which is fine. So it's one of the things that we can actually try and do with this. If we're looking at things like um, tobacco mosaic virus, obviously we need to use either an antibody test of some sort or we have to use a DNA test because we can't see the viruses under a microscope. So actually trying to identify those plants uh, those plant issues becomes quite difficult. Now we do actually have, and I'm just going to show you a couple of um, web searches at the moment. Absolutely, uh, Nico. Absolutely. So with uh, viruses, in exactly the same way as in animals, once the virus infects the plant cells, it uses the plant's own protein synthesis systems, so the ribosomes, to reproduce itself. Um, it will use the other systems of the plant to reproduce the DNA the viruses will actually spread inside the plant cells until they can actually spread from one cell to the other and the cells start bursting open. And when we start getting this, we start getting lots of issues with the plant, which means we'll, start, we'll get discoloration uh, because it can't produce enough uh, chlorophyll. And we'll get other issues as well, sometimes with the xylem and the phloem, so we can't actually spread the water and the nutrients around the plant. Now, we've got two issues in the UK at the moment which I was just going to show you. Now, these, one of them isn't, just, well, both of them aren't just the UK. One of them has become quite big in the UK, which is this one, which is Dutch elm disease. Now, you'll notice looking down here that it's caused by a uh, fungal infection. The problem is it actually causes huge amounts of damage to the vascular water system, causing plants to droop and then eventually die. And we've had lots and lots of traditional elm in the UK uh, that have been well, they've died themselves anyway. And the problem is being fungal, we know that with fungi they can release spores and those spores can spread far and wide and they can actually then infect lots of other elm. And this has become sort of fairly common, fairly big in the UK to the point where actually they've been going through killing those trees off and basically chopping them down as quickly as they can just to make sure that it doesn't have the chance hopefully to spread to other plants. We don't have any other way of treating at the moment. Uh, the other one that's causing a big issue at the moment, ash is one of the, I suppose, one of the most useful trees in the UK. We use it for building. It makes an amazing firewood. Uh, if you look at people that do coppicing and green woodwork, ash is one of the trees of choice. They'll use quite a lot. 
The problem is we've got this ash uh, dieback disease at the moment. Again, it's caused by some form of fungal infection and it actually starts causing the trees to rot uh, through the stems, through the bark. So in terms of what you were saying, Capri, about chopping these trees down, they're going to die anyway. It's just a case of how many trees they take out with them. So the best thing we can do is actually chop them down and burn them. Yeah, no problems at all. <laughs> um, do bear in mind, Capri, you can go back, you can watch this afterwards. The link will be in there in the notes as well. Um, and I will put a link in for a Google Meet and we'll do a 10 minute Google Meet if you want to after this. Um, I'll drop it into the year nine Google class. So if you've got any particular questions um, and I haven't answered them now, I'm more than happy to sort of drop in there and do that. Okay. But the, um, yeah, the ash dieback, I've got some colleagues that work in the sort of wood industry and they're having lots and lots of issues with this. If they find it in their woods, they're having to go through and literally chop back huge amounts of woodland before they can even think about replanting. Okay. So they're just two examples that are actually affecting the UK at the moment. Um, and it's not just now, it's been around for a little while. Brilliant, right. Come off that again for a minute. Fantastic. So, most of the reasons. Fungal infections are quite common. We do have viral and bacterial infections as well. And we'll have a look at some of the things they, some of the issues they can that can happen with them. <coughs> the problem with fungal infections, because fungi produce these spores, they're very, very, very tiny seeds, which means the wind can blow them, and they produce tens of thousands of them at any one moment in time. And of course, as soon as they get to another tree, they've only got to find a way into the tree, and it gets infected. So you can infect vast amounts at once, and because it's carried on the wind. They can actually travel hundreds of miles before they infect the next tree. So it's not a case of it's only going to affect a local area. They can actually affect huge amounts of a country or even the world. So when we're looking at the ash dieback at the moment, it's actually, you'll find, very common, not just in the UK, but right the way across Europe. So I just grabbed my pen again, dropped it on the floor this time, which was better than dropping it in my coffee the other day. Um, pests, again, as I said, we've got different parasites that can affect... Uh, aphids we will often find on plants where they will sort of tr inject into the plant and then sort of suck out the glucose uh, and the other and the sap and the other chemicals. Now what I want to do in a minute is have a quick look at some ways of dealing with that and some of it is the plant's techniques and some of it is treatments that the farmers can do or that we can do to try and manage it uh, but it will also give some ideas of why plants maybe look a bit different sometimes and a lot of it comes down to issues they've had with infection. Uh, just quickly, just two particular issues that you just need to be aware of with this one. And this isn't necessarily caused by a pathogen disease or a pest. It could be caused by poor soil. One of them is called chlorosis. If you link chloro to chlorophyll... What we're looking at is a chlorophyll deficiency. Now, if you can remember in humans, the main pigment, the main uh, mineral that we need in our blood for producing hemoglobin is going to be iron. So actually, yeah, poor soil, Nico, and you'll see what I'm, you'll see where I'm going with this in a moment. So, in humans, if we're anemic, that generally means we have a low iron count in our blood which means our body struggles to produce as many red blood cells. When we're looking at plants, plants don't use iron as one of their main minerals they need. Um, they'll need small amounts, but not in huge amounts like we do. <coughs> what the plants need is magnesium. And when we get chlorosis, we're looking at a magnesium deficiency. And the reason is, magnesium is the main mineral that is essential for the production of chlorophyll. So actually we need the magnesium to produce the chlorophyll. If we don't have enough magnesium in the soil, and remember that actually all plant minerals comes from the soil, we'll talk about growth a little bit in a moment, but all plant minerals comes from the soil. <laughs> um, then if we don't have enough of different minerals, we will get issues. And one of the key ones that you need to be aware of is this magnesium. Not enough magnesium, 
chlorophyll deficiency, and this, we call that chlorosis. Okay. Um, actually, it's a really easy one to deal with if you're at home. So the Epsom bath salts basically are a magnesium carbonate compound or magnesium chloride compound, depending on which ones you get. And you can put a pinch of that into the soil. Sounds really weird, but the Epsom bath salts contain lots of magnesium ions. You can put a pinch of that into the soil and that will actually deal with most issues of chlorosis um, from a home plant. Okay. So that's just worth being aware of there. The other issue you can get is nitrate. So we can get low nitrates. Now, we generally use fertilizers on plants to try and increase nitrates. Plants, there's not many plants that can actually generate their own nitrates. Uh, some of the pea, the, fam the, the pea families, they don't actually generate the nitrates themselves, but they have these nodules on their roots and those nodules contain different bacteria that can fix nitrogen in the air and turn it into uh, nitrates. Yeah, not all bath salts, Grace. You want to make, but the uh, the Epsom bath salts, if you look on them, generally contain magnesium ions, and you only need a small pinch to increase the magnesium content, and it can have quite a big effect on the chlorophyll levels. So, what you'll generally find is a lot of farmers will do what they call crop rotation, and uh, people at home, if we've got, uh, say, raised beds. And what you'll do is in different years, you'll grow, say, peas and different legumes in that soil because it actually helps to fix the nitrogen in and produce nitrates. If we're not going to do that, we can use fertilisers. So for the nitrates, we can use peas. Uh, we can use fertilisers. Oh, fertilisers, there we go. Um, and they will help increase the nitrates. Now, nitrates are really important because it's the main compound involved in amino acids. And hopefully, amino acids, that shouldn't be a new one for most of you, the amino acids are used to create proteins. Okay, so we need to be aware of that. Let me just put this in quickly, quickly while we're here. Formula, just so I can show you. There we go. So when we're looking at amino acids, the general formula for this, and you don't need to know this is a GCSE, I'm just putting it in um, just so that you can see what we're looking at. We've got this ammonium compound here, which will be produced from nitrates, attached to a carbon and a carbonate. And the year nines, you'll see some of this when we do organic chemistry in year 10. Don't worry about it too now if it's looking a bit scary. Um, but the molecules for all amino acids is basically this. And the only thing that changes is R. And R can be any one of a lot of different compounds. Okay. So what we're after are these nitrogens. And it's the one thing that the plants can't produce themselves. They've got to get from the soil in order to make it. So these are amino acids. And our plants join them together to make different proteins. Okay. Now, interestingly, well, I find it interesting, but then I'm a bit of a science geek when it comes to this. If you ask most students and most people where plant's mass comes from, so if you think about an oak tree uh, out there, and that oak tree could be, let's just say, 100 metres tall, uh, with a trunk that's maybe too big for us to get our arms round, there's probably going to be a few tonne of wood there. Now, that tree would have grown from an acorn, which weighs probably a few grams. So where did that mass come from? Now, what lots and lots of people try and do is they will turn around and say it comes from the soil. But if that was the case, then wherever plants were growing, you would end up with these um, big dips in the soil, which means all the roots would be exposed. And we know we don't get that. Now, there was a scientist and I always forget his name. Uh, bear with me one moment while I look it up. There we go. His name was, because it's a really big name, and you can look this up. There's a Veritasium video on this one. His name was 
Jan Baptist Van Helmont. Okay, and what he did was quite a famous experiment. <laughs> Name's Jeff. John Baptist Van Helmont. He did quite a famous experiment. He got a willow tree <coughs> and he planted it in some soil. Quite a lot of soil, but he planted it in some soil. He weighed the soil beforehand and he weighed the, the willow tree beforehand. And then over the next five years, he only put water into the soil. After the five years, he took the plant out and he re-weighed the soil and he re-weighed the plant. And what he noticed, and you'll have to look at the exact figures in this one, but the soil's mass only went down by about five grams. The mass of the tree, though, went up by about 70 kilograms. So he concluded, obviously, that there is absolutely no way that, that plant mass could have come from the soil. But what you should know is for, through photosynthesis that most of the plant's mass would actually have started off as the carbon dioxide that you're breathing in, uh, breathing out and breathing in. Okay, So the plants take that carbon dioxide in, they'll do photosynthesis with it, and then because they're making the molecules, which is why we class plants as producers, because they're making those molecules, that's where their mass is coming from. So it's actually coming from the carbon dioxide in the air, not from the soil. What the plants need the soil for is water, and also the minerals that it needs to avoid these deficiencies that we've been looking at there. Okay, so let's look at some things that plants do to try and avoid, uh, I suppose, being infected or once they are infected. In the same way that we looked at it for humans. Again, I'm going to bring up one of the SAPS posters, which is this one here. Now, plants in the same way as us will have this thick skin on the outside. They've got their waxy cuticle, which one is a waterproof layer, but it's also quite a thick protective barrier <coughs> that pathogens generally need to try and get through uh, before that plant can be infected, which is why if we take cuttings from plants, we do actually leave themselves open until the plants can actually seal themselves off. If they get in, and it could be through water, it could actually be through the stomata and the leaves, Again, if you can't remember that, go back and have a look at Biology 1 when we looked at leaf structures and we looked, and we looked at uh, plant cells because we should be happy with what guard cells and what stomata are. So go back and have a look at that. But some of them can get it in there. Um, they can puncture their way in. Some pathogens as well and some different insects actually release enzymes so they can actually dissolve their way through the plant's skin to get inside. Now, things that the plant can actually do to try and recover from this one. Let's go that way slightly. There we go. In some cases, what they'll do is they'll start strengthening the cell walls and they'll start growing new cells around the outside. And sometimes where you see branches that have been cut off or lost and you see these big burls on the side of trees. By the way, those burls make beautiful carving wood for bowls. Uh, but you see these big bowls, uh, burls. That's generally a growth where the tree or the plant was infected somehow. Um, and they can get huge. I mean, we're talking about uh, on some of the bigger trees, almost as big as this, the sort of tiny room we're in at the moment. Um, and that's where that tree has created these extra thick growths around the infection to try and stop it spreading. So that's one of the things that they can try and do. Um, you will sometimes see as well some insects, uh, particularly some of the singular wasps, not the ones that live uh, with in a nest with others, but some of the singular wasp insects, they can actually burrow their way inside, uh, which will actually cause the tree to cause the growth around the outside of it. Um, and then that will become their home. They can eat that out from the inside um, and they can then use that as their own individual home. They can lay their eggs in there um, and that will then be protected by this little tiny growth. And you often see that on small plants with that one, these little tiny homes. Again, I wonder if I can just try and find a picture of that. Um, uh, Hang on, bear with me a minute. I'm just going to take that off for a second. That's it, the way I was looking for. And once you've seen these, you'll actually start spotting them more often when you're out and about outside. So you can often see things looking like this growing on plants. 
<coughs> they're not particularly big, but they're called ghouls. So G A W L. And this has actually been produced uh, where a wasp has infected the plant. It's created this ghoul around the outside. Um, that then grows on the plant, which means we've then got sap. We've got nutrients, which the insects and the larvae of the wasps can actually feed upon. In a lot of cases, it doesn't actually cause permanent damage to the plant like some of the bigger infections do. But they create sort of a relationship, uh, not exactly symbiotic, because I don't think the plant gets anything for it afterwards, unless if the wasp goes round and eats some of the other parasites that might be living on the plant. Okay, so wasp ghouls, and you will start noticing these quite a bit. This is one that you find on an oak tree. Um, this one's apple, so it's worth just going and having a look later on, next time you're out and about, and seeing if you can identify anything like that. So we've got some of the different uh, issues with those. Some plants as well will actually shed limbs. So it's not often, it's not always caused by infection. Sometimes it's just caused by water loss or infections. Um, oak trees, if they get particularly stressed due to water loss, can randomly drop big branches. The beech tree, uh, you shouldn't really ever camp or eat or spend too much time under a beech tree. Uh, in the sort of camping world, in the bushcraft world, they're sort of called widow makers because they literally will randomly drop branches for no known reason, um, but they'll just shed the entire branch out. And I think a lot of it comes down to either water loss or infection of that, um, but they literally will just drop the branch for no reason at all, and there's no warning for it. I know several years ago, there's a primary school teacher that was actually out uh, on a school field trip with some primary school kids, and she had her lunch under it, and she was actually killed just by a randomly falling branch. And when you look up, the branches don't look dead, um, but they just get dropped. So that's something else that can happen as well. So we've got here healthy cells around the infected one will literally kill themselves to try and stop the pathogen spreading. So we can have that as well. Okay. Um, the last one I want to have a look at from this point of view is actually having a look. Yeah, I know. Luckily, because um, I spend a lot of time camping in woods under trees, <coughs> there's not that many trees that do it. Beach is the main one. So the other thing we can look at is actually as farmers or as gardeners, how can we try and reduce pests? A lot of the initial technique comes down to the fact that uh, different pests will be specific to different plants. And by pests, I'm including pathogens in this as well. So not all plants. So for instance, if we're looking at the fungi that affects the elm trees, a lot of the other trees around it will be perfectly safe. It won't infect them. So things we can do is to actually try and grow multiple types of plants in one area because it reduces the likelihood of them spreading from plant to plant. If we have a very dense crop amount together, then actually any pathogens or pests can spread between those plants very fast. Um, other things that farmers do or gardeners do as well is they'll do crop rotations, uh, partly to condition the soil, but partly if you get some fungi, some spores, uh, different pathogens, eggs in the soil, by growing a different crop there next year, it possibly won't be able to affect, infect that plant, so it will die off. So when you come back to using that area, then the soil hopefully uh, won't infect any of the new plants you put in there. Now, we can also spray them. Spraying generally should be a last resort because we're putting chemicals on potential crops, especially if we're going to eat those crops. Um, but by using herbicides and fungicides and pesticides on them, we can kill them off. In some areas, we will also introduce uh, biological pests. So I know for a fact in our garden, I've introduced ladybirds before. Uh, ladybirds themselves and the larvae of ladybirds, which are called lacewing, they will eat hundreds, if not thousands of aphids per ladybird. So the aphids are said are the ones that kill off roses and other um, insects as well. Uh, sorry, other plants as well. So actually growing ladybirds and things like that are brilliant. One, actually, they don't cause us any issues, but they will literally go through and just decimate some of the pests. Um, the other thing we've done before, if you've got a problem with snails and slugs, you can buy what they call nematodes. Now, all soil contains nematodes, and they're microscopic worms. Uh, they're completely harmless to us. However, they will actually burrow and go into, and yeah, if you thought it was grim before, this gets worse. They will actually bury into the slugs and the snails, they eat them from the inside out and they kill the slugs and the snails. So we've done it before. We've actually gone and bought nematodes and you water them into the garden two or three times through the year. Um, and you get no slugs and snails that year because it kills them off. So, yeah, that works quite well. 
<laughs> nice one, Capri. Um, cool. Peas and potatoes, Grace. Nice one. Yeah, we've got some growing outside at the moment. <coughs> Get some pictures. I quite like... Uh, I need to start growing more herbs and things at the moment because we seem to be getting through quite a few of those and I'm not growing enough. Uh, the one thing we do need to be careful of with biological pest control, and it's one thing that Australia learned the hard way, is you've got to make sure that whatever biological methods you put in are actually uh, they're native to that environment. Because if you start trying to bring in species from other countries, for instance, they can actually have a massive effect on the ecosystem because they weren't there before. So we need to be aware of that as well. Uh, the final method we do is actually any plants that goes in and out of the country should generally be inspected to make sure that they're not contaminated. Uh, I'll go back to Australia again because they did learn the hard way. They actually, in terms of the biological pest control, they had issues with the cane beetle destroying their sugar cane plants. So what they looked at is other parts of the world that had the same pest. And what they did is they decided actually there was something called the sugar cane toad. And I've got to show you a picture of this because it's um, big. In fact, these ones get huge. You can sort of see a small one here being held by hand. And these they get much, much bigger than this. Here you go. Here's a bigger one there. Um, unfortunately, the countries that had the sugarcane toad, they generally... <coughs> did, the sugarcane didn't grow very high. But in Australia, it goes quite high. So what happened is the sugarcane beetle went higher up the cane. So the toads couldn't get to them. So the toads then had to try and find alternative sources of food. Um, in which case they started turning to a lot of the native uh, insects. They started turning to a lot of the native animals from things from small mice, um, small cats, small dogs, if they can get them. Um, and pretty much anything else they could actually eat that would fit in their mouths. So, yeah, they had a major problem. And it's not just the first thing. Australia have had issue with lots of other types of insects as well. To the point that now there is a huge fine... Um, and potential prison sentence if you bring any type of food into the country uh, that is actually not already pre-packaged. So if you were to try and bring some fresh apples in, for instance, there'll be probably a several thousand pound fine put on top, put onto you for that. So yeah, they most countries, the one I've been through sort of customs before, they're really interested. Have you got any drugs? Have you got any of this? Have you got any of that? Um, I have never heard a customs officer have such a go at somebody. For then this woman in front of us that would try to bring in a bag of apples. <coughs> if you try and bring anything made of wood, they'll make sure that it, the wood has actually been uh, properly stabilised to make sure there isn't any chance of any insects or pests living inside the wood. And a lot of it is to make sure their ecosystem doesn't get affected. Okay? Right. Let's just find out the last few things that I might have to go through. Okay, so a couple of other things then that plants can do. Um, they can release antibacterial chemicals. So we know, for instance, that plants like tea tree, the tea tree plant, uh, is naturally antimicrobial, antiseptic. Uh, we use it very well for treating spots. We can use it. Um, I know some shampoos have put it in. It's meant to be very good for getting rid of head lice, keeping head lice away. So we've got that side of things as well. So tea tree would naturally produce these anti uh, bacterial and there's other trees that do it as well fantastic uh good for the hair yeah literally uh capri the one with the apples was brilliant um except there was a lot more expletives used by the um customs officer than you put in there um they will also have poisons we know that some plants are poisons and some of them will mimic having uh, the same color as other plants that are poisons to try and stop themselves getting eaten or to try and stop themselves getting infected uh, we've got some plants that will actually move. So some of them, when you touch the leaves, they will actually, the leaves will curl up to try and pull away um, and possibly frighten things out of the way. Uh, thorns and hairs on the plants make them, so I avoid them getting eaten. Uh, and there was one more. And I'm just going to drop a picture onto the whiteboard for a minute. Where some of the plants have actually, in terms of mimicry, they've actually decided to mimic uh, rocks. So I'll put that one on and I've got one more of the same species. So these are types of succulents. They're called lithops. 
and they're actually in the ground and they look exactly like a rock so you wouldn't even know they're there so pl uh, plants try to avoid eating them but the top of the plant <coughs> is translucent so it lets all the light through so most of the photosynthesis actually happens underground okay so we've got that as well so we've got mimicry we've got um leaf curl leaves moving we've got thorns and hairs uh we've got poisons and we've also got the antiseptic uh, we've got the waxy cuticle we spoke about as well. Uh, we've got the thick cell wool. And finally, we've got thick bark. So the bark forms this sort of protective layer around the outside of trees, around the outside of um, some plants as well. So those are the different methods for trying to reduce infection by plants. Right, just looking through my notes, that's pretty much everything I need to go through with this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the video now. I'll save all the work we've done. I'll drop the invite for Google Meet into... <laughs> um, I'll drop the invite for Google Meet uh, into Google Classroom. So you can jump online, say hello and answer any questions you might need to do. And then the video and any of the notes I'll upload to Google Classroom in a few minutes as well. Okay? Not a problem at all. Take care.